Q. So in okay. Thank you. So let me just share my screen here. Okay. And while you're doing that, Ian, just to give you a second or two, uh, remember um, you will have a chance to ask questions at different points after Ian's covered uh, some slides. So you know that you'll you'll be interactive as he's presenting. We will also have a chance to have a Q and A at the end, and you can also use the chat function of Zoom to ask any questions and I can raise these on your behalf. Okay, so Ian. Okay, so hopefully you can see that now. Uh, just give me, uh, give me a verbal there, uh, Erling, because- Yes, uh, all good. In, uh, okay, cool. Um, so um, kudos and credit to Dev on this. Uh, Dev has presented two of these sessions and basically put this deck together. Um, I've uh, plagiarized it completely and, um, and made a, a couple of, of mods myself just as, as I'm presenting today. So um, the, the topic is good project governance. Um, so I popped in a definition from the project management uh, body of knowledge guys. Um, so, so you can see it there. It's, it's the key pieces are alignment of project objectives with the strategy and um, that the project governance is just is defined by and required to fit with a larger context of the program um, the key piece though is around the or the sponsoring uh, component of it and uh, we'll, we'll delve into that a bit more okay so Okay, so it's important to realize at the outset that uh, project governance doesn't equate to project management. It's, it's a component of it, but it's, it's very much a, a piece out on its own. Uh, it provides an oversight function, and uh, the key elements of it are in the area of leadership and strategic direction. It, it provides uh, guidance for the project manager from the various stakeholders. Um, in larger organizations, it ensures a compliance with the sort of framework of what that organization wants to do. So uh, often that can be a program management office or a technical project office. Um, it sets boundaries and accountability. So a key sort of identification of the leadership, who is the executive sponsor of the project who are the key stakeholders in various areas also um, it outlines limits of authority so often that can be financial budgetary but it also can be there may be a decision that the marketing team have to make and it it should identify key stakeholder and who the the accountable person is is in on that area and they should be a, a part of the, the governance group. So um, there are two other significant areas. It uh, controls and decisions is a key uh, aspect of the governance mechanism. And I think this is possibly the most important uh, component of it. So governance will change um, at, over the life cycle of the, the, of the program. At the start, it's all about creation of the group, um, getting up a good structure um, as to how the program should go about, how to communicate out. But the, a key aspect is in the area of control and decisions as the, as the project and program uh, develops. So often a project manager will go to uh, the governance with possibly a range of options, but will look for a steer from that group as to uh, whether to, to take option A or B. And, all, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. So assurance and challenge, um, ensuring the project is doing what it should be. So uh, again, um, project managers will, will be used to giving dashboards of how, how progress is going, whether they'd be um, weekly reports, reg reports, red, amber, and green sort of dashboards. This, uh, when you're meeting with your governance group, this is 
very much a high level view of progress and you're really outlining deviations from uh, maybe the previous session when, when speaking to the group. And uh, the uh, last point here, it's providing confidence and feedback and that the project is, is going well and that the, the sponsor is happy with the, the progress and they'll be, this is the forum for that feedback. So um, I'm not watching chat, although I see there's a, a night, uh, something in the eye, in the chat area there. So if there's any questions at this point, or Alan, if you want to. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Here. In that chat was actually from myself to everyone saying, if you have any questions, ask here. So nothing. Okay, cool. That, so cool. yeah, carry on. All right. So. Uh, just broken down the governance into, into three major sections, which I'll, 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 I'll talk through now. So people, uh, structure, and key information. And I'll just delve into those in, in a bit more detail. So uh, as I said, the, the focus of, of a governance group will uh, change over the life cycle of the, the the project. Early on, it's ensuring that there's a clear strategic direction, everybody is um, bought in and understands what the purpose and the ultimate vision of the, the project is. It's around assembly of the, um, the governance team um, early on. It's key that the in the area of engaged stakeholders that the sponsor is of a suitable level of seniority within the business and that they have, um, I think it's mentioned, skin in the game that they uh, understand and have a, a key part of their uh, performance, I suppose, within the organization is tied into this, into, into the project and program. That is an absolute necessity for any pro, uh, project or program, whether it's small or large, that there's a, a key buy-in from, from the sponsor. Um, so other, again, the, the, these aspects of, the, of governance are, tend to be at the outset, the initia, initialization or initiation of the, of the project program. And a clear understanding of the project, how it will Im, impact or uh, various areas. You might have a mix of commercial departments, marketing, finance involved, depending on the breadth of the project. So there'll be uh, input and, and an understanding of how the, the program project is going to affect or benefit the, those particular areas. Um, another, uh, so as the program moves along, um and the setup is is there the focus can often change uh, or a primary component of this would be if there was log jams for the project or if if two conflicting priorities uh, had come about the an excellent use of the government's mechanism is to either attempt to remove those log jams uh, or make priority calls. And, and that's the project manager's job to basically present those to the, the group. And, and often, um, and this is just a, a sort of a practical tip over the years of working with uh, governance groups, a huge amount of the work here is done in, in preparation. If there's two particular priority calls that have to be made, um, and the project manager preps those and often goes and uh, talks to the governance members so that they're aware of it and that they're well informed as to what the options are. And when it comes to the governance session itself, they're, they're in a position to uh, review and make a, a decision on the spot. Um, various roles uh, and responsibilities. Uh, we, you can see here uh, it's clear lines of accountability, uh, clear boundaries, and um, there's a, a racy uh, matrix responsibilities, accountability, consulting, and informing, and that's uh, included in the uh, one of the slides at the end of this day. 
Okay. So moving on. Let, to let me structure. just see then, um, Ian. So there's nothing in the chat. Actually, one thing is coming in the chat now, but let's um, let's see if uh, anyone has any verbal. You know, if they want to ask any questions verbally, sure, um, sure. and then I'll ask one from the chat as well. Uh, before we move on so remember you you need to unmute yourself uh, you're all on mute but do you have any questions that you'd like to direct to Ian okay let me let me ask from the chat then Ian so the question is um, what do we do as a PM if there is a lack of engagement from stakeholder uh, in the middle of the project so how do we ensure engagement okay well a um i suppose if it's a if it's a stakeholder representing a functional unit it might be a matter of checking in with them seeing if the responsibilities have changed and is there a potential for an alternate to be uh be put into the into the steering group if it's the sponsor it's it's a much more difficult uh scenario because you absolutely need buy-in from the the sponsor and uh, it's it's a matter of really discussing that with them and uh, essentially saying that unless that uh, uh, engagement is there it becomes extremely difficult and challenging for the the uh, project manager to get guidance and to, to to get through the get through the work without that key sponsor involvement so uh, martin and Dev? Want to jump in? yeah yeah uh, um, anything you'd want to add in terms yeah. of how you ensure engagement from a stakeholder and you know the specific example or question was in the middle of a project so perhaps they were engaged oh. and no longer engaged uh, what suggestions do you have so um Aruma, the first thing to say is that stakeholder engagement is notoriously difficult and it's one of the key challenges in, in, in a project um and an element here is actually getting your sponsor um, and your uh, board, project board involved in trying to help solve some of these issues. And this is what um, all the um, uh, governance uh, element is, uh, is about as well. Um, find out why they've become disengaged. There might be, um, look, there could be any number of reasons. They may have moved on, they may have uh, uh, personal difficulties, etc. cetera. Um, it also depends on how um, uh, important and relevant they are to the project. Um, and how much time you need to spend in actually bringing them back on board. Um, not that I'm saying that stakeholders aren't important, but you know there are different levels. When you do your race, your stakeholder analysis, you'll be able to uh, understand how important they are to the project, and then uh, hopefully come up with strategies accordingly. Um, but yeah, it is as um, um, Ian said, it is about finding out from them what the situation is, why they can be engaged. Um, they may be. They may think that the project's going down the wrong, uh, doing the wrong thing, or not, not really doing what it's meant to be doing. In which case, you may need to do a bit of a review. And, and is, is that really the case, or have they got a different understanding of it? Um, and then certainly um, try and bring in um, your um, your sponsor and um, uh, the other people around you to try and help resolve the, uh, uh, the issue. Okay, thanks, Dev. And Martin, any thoughts from yourself? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the guys have already covered most of it. I mean, the, the key thing for me is is that understanding of why they're no longer engaged. Um, you know, the, the, the stakeholder really should be the person that's the, almost the, the leader of the ship, um, setting strategy in and, and, and making sure that the project or program is aligned to that. Um, potentially, it could be that just the communication is, is not aligned to what they want to hear. It could be that they're comfortable that the activity or the project or program is, is running uh, all green so therefore they don't need to have that uh, you know in, you tend to find that some of these stakeholders are, are very busy individuals so if they see everything as green they potentially will just um, not necessarily lose interest but they um, they will focus on things that aren't aren't so healthy so understanding why they've switched off maybe adjusting the communication and reporting to to hit that maybe make sure it hits the mark as as um, Ian said you know as you go through the the, the delivery things will change and the way you report and communicate potentially changes as well. So um, people who don't live this day in, day out will have a different view of what they want to see from a communication perspective to the people that live it every day. So make sure the communications are right. Make sure that they, you understand why they're not engaged and, and to, to the points the guys have already made, either, either look to 
to create um, a delegation to get a new stakeholder in or, or bring that stakeholder back into uh, to be focused. Okay, and I'll just um, add one tool that I've used um, just to see if it helps. So if you think of uh, categorizing your stakeholders, and I know look, all the points that have been mentioned already are you know, all right and exactly uh, what you need to do. So it's been answered, but a tool um, that I've used is identifying your stakeholders that you need to keep satisfied those that you need to manage closely, the ones that you need to monitor and the ones that you need to keep informed. So, you know, uh, a priority list for your stakeholders, if you like. And then depending on where they fit in that priority, if they're the highest priority stakeholder and therefore you need them engaged, well, it might be that you actually have to escalate, right? So they were engaged, whatever is going on in their world, too busy, whatever, may require escalation. Perhaps you need to change the stakeholder. Whereas if they're a stakeholder that you're simply keeping informed, but they're no longer too interested, well, maybe you just take them out of your stakeholder list. But anyway, so that's just a tool I've used. So back to yourself, Ian. Okay. So, um, okay, so just moving on to structure and uh, one of the things, uh, uh, and Alim shared the outcomes uh, that people who were attending the, the, the call today wanted to get out of it. It struck me that uh, a lot of the attendees were uh, starting off in project management and things like that. And, and a lot of what we've talked about up to now, uh, you know, would, 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 are larger organizations and, 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 and the like, where there might be various levels, there might be large amounts of stakeholders. Often in a, in a, in a, in a, a smaller project, you may have just one stakeholder. But I suppose the framework uh, that we're working towards here still applies. You know, they, uh, your, your sponsor, uh, they're giving you the strategic context of why this is being done. There's somebody, there's a, a key person that you're going to for decision-making where it isn't a, a sort of a day-to-day -day project management piece of work where you can call, make that call yourself as a PM. And, and they're operating within an overall framework within the organization. I, I suppose it's, it's rare enough to have no framework whatsoever. I mean, it, it, it can happen. Uh, new startup companies where they're basically building up a framework from scratch. But uh, often, and we'll talk a bit about frameworks right at the end where there's a few guides that can be given there. So, uh, so just again, a common thread, irrespective of whether it's a large organization or small, there's a plan that you're working to uh, towards. Uh, the key communication messages at governance is how are we doing against miles against key milestones. They're not going to want to go down into nitty gritty. That's the PM's job. Uh, it's a matter of bringing out if a, a constraint or any risks or issues have come up, uh, that this forum is the mechanism for, for dealing with that. And uh, then uh, as the pro project and program moves towards the end of the life cycle, then it's a matter of analyzing the success, benefits, and indeed shortcomings and failures. Uh, and, the, and that's a key uh, learning and piece of work that a governance group has to do because they, uh, the organization wants to learn from how this has gone. They want to build it into a sort of a, a knowledge base for future pieces of work and ensure that uh, whether benefits or failures or anything, are taken account of and uh, either repeated where good or avoided where bad. Okay, um, so if the governance board provides a level of scrutiny on what we've talked about, and there's a, a key point here that the project manager um, themselves has no authority. Uh, they have uh, delegated uh, authority to basically run the project, but ultimately the key decisions are the sponsors or a broader governance uh, group's uh, remit. Okay, and, that, and that's something that, um, again, where junior project managers, um, you know, starting out in their career often can get um, extremely sort of feel on the spot a bit about this that they have to make a call and how how should they make a call you basically can 
uh, as a PM, you, you can you can rely on the sponsor, or you basically reach out to them and look for help and those decision making points from them. And that's that's just a a, a key thing to be aware of. Okay, so I'm going to move on. And let me just ask so, again, uh, if I may, Ian, sorry uh, to interject. Sure. So no questions in the chat, but just to see if anyone has uh, any other questions uh, before we move on. Remember to unmute yourself if you need to. Any questions or what Ian's covered so far, what we've discussed? Okay, so it seems like there aren't, um, so I'll let you move on, but yeah, please do use the chat function then if you need to. Okay, so um, information, uh, the passing on of information in a suitable way is, is, is one of the key aspects of the, the governance structure as well. Um, calling out, do, um, this is a, a, another key one for, for project managers, whether they're setting out in their career or more experienced. Um, call out in a non-emotive way what's going well, what's not. Yeah. Um, uh, again, if I just pick out another point here in transparency, don't hide problems. As uh, uh, um, a project manager I worked with uh, many years ago said, uh, bad news doesn't age well. Uh, so basically, if you're aware of something, um, keeping it to yourself and uh, talking about it two and three weeks later, uh, the likelihood is that the situation has deteriorated. So um, be open and transparent in these in these sessions. And that's how, uh, you know, sort of dashboarding uh, of reporting where there's sort of key risks that are highlighted. And then uh, as the group monitors risks, they could materialize into issues. So they've got early warning of what could materialize and, and what actually does uh, come about. Okay, so it's a it's very much a, a record. It's important to uh, record and document what uh, the inputs and very much the outputs of the uh, stakeholder sessions as well. These are key points for um, logging decisions where. Uh, a, you know, like I said earlier, there may have been two priority calls, multiple priority calls, and the, the governance board has made a call on that. The PM will document that, circulate it for comment, and that will be used then as the sort of area of record if, if the project is being reviewed or if uh, at a later point um, a query has gone as to why a certain decision was made. It's, it's critical that the, um, any of the outputs of these uh, governance sessions are documented. Okay, um, so- and There is uh, a uh, question, um, and it's about the previous slide, if I could just ask. Um, is, uh, uh, let, let me just, uh, it's Caroline that's asking, so she may want to explain more, but, um, uh, so the question is, I wanted to clarify we've been on the assurance piece of work they called out on the previous slide. So Caroline, do you want to explain that a bit more in terms of what you're looking for? Oh, hi, sorry. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, it's just um, he called out on the assurance piece of work. So I know in my current role now, you know, we are doing some assurance work there and that is far as I'm concerned is obviously um, checking with the, you know, with the other projects that they've actually carried out what then, you know, they've been tasked to do. So I was just a bit confused when he talked about, um, you know, the project manager not having any authority and things like that. So I just wanted to know, um, you know, what that meant um, in terms of um, his earlier explanation, please. Yeah, that's helpful. And someone asked me that uh, in a private message as well as to, you know, that's quite a, a statement there. Project management has no authority. So can you explain that, please, Ian? From the yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it, it does. Uh, and, I, and I note when, when Dev put it into the slides, I was going, yeah, that's it's it's a, it's a it's an interesting. Well, it's it's a 
It's something that PMs feel that they are in a position to rule on uh, all sorts of, of work, but they have to understand their uh, area and realm of responsibility. So um, if there's a, a particular issue that uh, comes up on the project and it impacts, we'll say, marketing area, and they say, well, this is, uh, the, the PM themselves can only present the options. It's, it's ultimately the stakeholders who have to make the decision. Um, I mean, the, the project manager has all sorts of authority at the individual project, at the individual project level, managing the, the, the various teams working for them. But the, the point here is has no authority at the governance uh, level in that their role is to present on options to to report out on how finances are doing they have no authority to call for extra finance it's it's this governance group that uh, have the ultimate authority at that level yeah. so thanks and I have a comment on that as well but uh, Dev um, would you like to just give us your view and your experience around this sure sure so um, I think um, uh, we need to be a bit clear on the assurance side of things, um, uh, Caroline. Um, assurance has different levels. At a project level, definitely um, the project manager or the PMO will be looking at reports coming in, at the highlight reports that come in, and uh, look at the uh, information that's pro provided by project managers and the project teams, uh, and will need to assure that the information that's provided at that level. The assurance we're talking about here is at a governance level. So when things um, are running well, then the assurance is really quite easy and, 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 and straightforward for project boards and, and sponsors uh, because they're getting their highlight reports that have been quality assured and quality checked by PMO and the uh, project managers um, and they can then um, react to those. Um, moving on to the question about um, a project manager having no authority, I think the, the proviso there is except for that delegated to them by the board and the sponsor. So um, ultimately, a project manager has constraints uh, uh, within which they have to work. Um, there might be financial constraints, they have got time constraints, the business constraints, um, and as long as they're working within those uh, constraints, then yes, they make the decisions to make, uh, and, and they can take the project forward. The moment they need to go outside those constraints, well, they have to go to the board and ask for permission. Um, if they need more money, they have to go and ask for more money. Um, if they need to uh, uh, extend the time of the project, they can't make that decision. They have to ask the permission of the sponsors and stakeholders. So that's what we mean that a project manager uh, has no authority from that perspective. Yeah. Hope okay. that helps. Yeah, and I'll just add one comment, um, a light hard comment. Uh, so most project managers, perhaps not, not the ones on here, not on this group, but most project managers exaggerate, tell a fib or two, et cetera. So from a, a project governance perspective and the assurance that you're providing at that level, uh, for me, it's more about uh, the project manager not marking their own homework and having someone who's part of the project, you know, governance, whatever form that governance takes, assuring that what's being said, the money being spent, the deliverables being claimed to have been done are actually what, what is being stated. So having third party, when I say third party, you know, an independent person assuring the work, even if it's from the same organization but a different department or a different aspect of the project, providing the assurance I completely agree is good. Whereas in most cases, yes, it is the project manager that does also assure and have authority, but that's where projects do overrun and more money is spent than it needed to be, et cetera. But anyway, let me stop there because I think maybe Martin, you wanted to come in as well or? I keep, I keep going last, don't I? So no, Sorry, I, Martin, I, next I, time I'll put you I first. Add, the only thing I would add is, is tolerance. Um, and as Deb says, you know, the, the governing board could give uh, the uh, project manager authority to, um, to to have full control or whatever it may be, uh, but equally it could just um, provide some level of tolerance to that as well. So again, that gives the project manager another level of authority within the project that they're running. But again, it's that reporting and, and explaining um, as to why you know, and the tolerance could be time, it could be financial, it could be people, it could be lots of different things. But that gives you an extra um, window to play with as well kind of thing. Yeah. Caroline, does that answer your question? 
I know it's quite strong saying project manager has no authority, but hopefully it's been explained. Is that okay with yourself? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Okay, so let's move on then, Ian. Okay. So um, we've talking, spoken through a bit on the communication side. So again, uh, progress and budget, uh, you know, it's it, it key, just high level uh, communication back as to how the, the project is progressing. Often, um, okay, I'm not, so um, again, many organizations will have very, formality around stage gates potentially to move from analysis and design into implementation. Um, it will uh, often the governance group, again, um, a PMO might get involved in checking that all the artifacts to move from one stage gate to another are in place, but ultimately it'll be the governance group that uh, gives the imprimatur or the okay on, on the move from to, to get uh, through that gate. And that's a, a key sort of, again, there, there may be on, an, on a multi-month or a multi-year program that uh, stage gate review may not come up uh, very often. But when it does, there's a lot of preparation and the, the governance group are asked for their uh, okay to proceed to the next point. Okay, um, and again, uh, something that um, was mentioned earlier on, often with these governance groups, uh, these are uh, senior in, in the business. They have potentially multiple programs uh, reporting into them. So it's very important to keep the messaging simple uh, uh, keep it on a on a scheduled basis that that that, that they know that you know first of the month they'll they'll be getting an update from this program etc. Uh, making sure that regularity uh, occurs and uh, a key point for the the um, project manager or program manager communicating is it's their role to highlight and point out issues. Um, often uh, a sort of deck that goes to a steering group will have the key components up front and it may have an appendix of various progress reports and things like that that are not necessarily for discussion at the, at the governance session but are included in the deck to give a full um, depth and breadth of what's been going on so that the, the uh, sponsors or governance members can look at that at their leisure, but not necessarily at the session itself. Okay, uh, now that was the, uh, the main areas of governance that I wanted to talk about. Um, now we've been having Q&A throughout. I just wanted to point, I, I, I believe the slides are going out. I definitely, I know Elim is putting out a, a copy of the recordings of the uh, events. So I just wanted to highlight that there's a, an example of a, a RACI in here and various uh, frameworks and methodologies as well that again, as I noticed some, when some of the questions came in as to what people would want to get out of this, these are good frameworks to delve into where there's um, maybe potentially no framework in an organization or where a framework is there and you want to find a bit more information on it. These, there's a, a large range of them here. So I just wanted to highlight that they're in the, in the deck as well. Yeah. Great. Do you want to leave that framework uh, slide open, actually? Uh, that might prompt some sure. questions. Um, uh, but yeah, we can. Um, so look, we've got time. We've already answered some questions. Great presentation. Thanks. In Dev, I know you pulled it together for, uh, first time and led the first two sessions. So really good. Um, so let's use the time that we've got now, up to another 20 minutes if need be, to cover any other questions that anyone has on governance, project management, you know, whatever you're seeing in front of you, a anything else, anything you're unsure of or you want um, to explore a bit more. Remember, you can unmute yourself and actually I'll take the courtesy to unmute you all. Um, While we're waiting, um, Alim, I just wanted to point out that the link that's posted at the bottom of this slide 
mm. um, actually um, provides explanations for each one of these frameworks oh. and methodologies. Okay. Uh, so I admit I found it quite useful because they, 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 many of these I, I knew nothing about. So it was good to just um, read a little bit about them as well. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. So, and uh, Ian, you touched about uh, sharing the slides, so I will, uh, but the recordings are all made available as well in the Slack channel. So anything else that's on your mind that you want to raise? Okay, so there's a question in the chat, which we can uh, uh, raise here. So how do you decide which frameworks and methodology needs to be used in a certain project at the governance stage and who are the main uh, key people who decide it? So I guess, yeah, how do you decide if it's Prince2 or APMG or Agile or whatever? Um, Martin, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> oh God, you know my beyond frameworks. Jeez, that's not good. Um, so, so I think certainly most organizations that I've worked in, they will have their own view in terms of the frameworks they want to use. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily become a PM's choice to pick a framework they fancy. Um, a, a lot, certainly, of the organizations say seem to have one or two frameworks that they work through. Um, certainly, in my experience, the, the usual kind of culprits like Prince2 and MSP, um, Kanban, Agile, you know, they seem to be the most popular ones, but Devonier may have different views. Well, um, I, I, I would uh, just a yeah, similar message on that. It's, it's rare enough that an organization doesn't have some sort of framework. Yeah. Um, they may be adapting. I know I worked in, a, in, a, in an organization where they were moving from Prince 2 to an agile environment. And, um, but it's a, usually a, a PMO will have a rough framework that you are expected to, to work through so it's unusual unless you're brought in on a sort of a consulting basis to to uh formulate or create a framework it's it's it's, it's unusual if that you'd have to decide on that framework yourself yeah and then um so i'll just add then oh, and of course it depends on uh which country you're in as well right so in some countries uh so say let's take the uk prince 2 is often favored but if you're in the USA, then it may be PMI, for example. So yeah, but we've all, you know, the, it's already been answered in terms of it depends on the organization. If the organization doesn't have any framework, um, then you're in trouble. Unless, as Ian said, you're brought well, well, in to, to help them out, right? You, to, to help create it. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in a circumstance when an organization doesn't have any framework or it's a small company that's trying to run a project and they've nominated a project manager to, to run it, then go with some of the simpler ones. And at the risk of being shut down, I would say something like Prince2 is a relatively straightforward um, methodology to use. But I think it's important to understand that these are only methodologies and frameworks. They're there to help you understand how to deliver things and how to um, uh, uh, go through the processes that, are, that you need to follow. Um, but they're there to advise and guide. They're not there to say, this is how you need to do things. Um, I'm a great believer in adapting and, and managing to keep things to make it work best for what you need. So I've run projects that I've used combinations of Prince2, um, Scrum, and um, uh, um, Agile to actually deliver the project. Um, and that's really dependent on, 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 on how things um, need to be done. And then um, just moving on to um, another question I've just seen on, on there, which is related. How do we apply um, Agile or indeed any other framework to, to PMO? Again, it's dependent on your organization and what they've got in place. Um, there are some standards that you need to follow and, and, and uh, use as a guide to uh, implement your services. Um, with regards to Agile particularly, I would say that um, there's Agile with a big A or Agile with a small A. Um, and I would say, ag I, I, would, I could use Agile with a small A, which is you need to be Agile, flexible, um, adaptive. Um, so where you've got processes that you're following and uh, lots of review and, and, and um, standardization that you need to implement, then do that on a simple, straightforward basis that doesn't add too much unnecessary paperwork. Because project managers and project teams are there to deliver. And while documentation is very, very important, as, as um, uh, Ian mentioned in one of these uh, uh, slides earlier on, it is something that you also do need to be pragmatic and realistic about. How much assurance, how much review do you really need to make sure that something gets delivered? 
Yeah, and uh, w when I join an organization, often the first discussion I'm having uh, with the PMO is, do you have levels of governance? Uh, they, they often will have uh, light touch, potentially a light touch uh, framework, even within their own organization. There's a realization there that small projects don't need all the uh, various uh, levels and artifacts. But the, the key framework about having a sponsor, having a governance um, grouping and communication to them, that's a sort of common thread through all. But some, some project sizes, some large programs, they'll have all the bells and whistles. Some, if you've got a, a, a PMO who understands that there's a certain amount of artifacts just don't add to uh, management of a smaller project. You know, so. Any other thoughts from anyone? Any questions? Okay, let, let me just ask them before we wrap up, um, just to see if uh, from the people who are on the call, how many of you are using some form of agile methodology right now in delivering a piece of work or project? Um, hi, it's Caroline again. I think with my um, organization, I think sometimes, you know, or, or sort of what I've learned, sometimes we say we're doing our job, but then it sometimes doesn't feel like we are. Um, <laughs> so that was why, you know, sort of I asked the question. Now, some people would say, um, because obviously I, I work within the PMO function and I know, you know, my role involves a portfolio, which is collecting data, doing a lot of reporting and, and things like that, you know, but then sometimes, you know, you kind of get that um, backlash where people say, well, this is meant to be agile. So you, you don't know, but then again, you've got that governance in place that you have got to, to adhere to and you've got to follow. So it's sort of um, looking on the best practice or when I go into a new role, um, what am I, and it's totally agile, I'm just trying to understand how I sort of come across as not being, um, I don't know, waterfall or really yeah. in my approach. Yeah. 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 So just, uh, you know, when you asked that question and it's already been answered, um, the thing that was going through my uh, mind is um, it's an impossible situation. Um, so if you know one person or a few people in a PMO are trying to introduce some agile concepts or if the, if the organization is meant to adopt agile but kind of aren't, you know, it's a bit of this, a bit of that, um, it's such a challenging and difficult place to be because the mindset across the various different parts of the organization will all be at different odds. Um, so in my view, you know, I know that's maybe come across as a bit negative, but you can't win. There'll always be someone blocking you somewhere along the journey. So to fully and truly embrace agile, actually, I think there would need to be an organizational shift to adopting agile. And there are frameworks out yeah. there that look to do that. Um, so I'll just mention one, if I may, um, it's uh, cause you know, there's many different agile frameworks. So, so there's agile PM, there's print to agile, et cetera, et cetera. The framework that I'm aware of that tries to address this top down, so throughout the whole organization as a framework, is the safe uh, agilist framework. It's the only one. Uh, so that's the capital S, capital A, capital F, and small e. So if you've seen that anywhere. Now, I'm not advocating one over another, but I know that that's the agile framework that tries to do it you know, throughout the whole organization. And some organizations um, have adopted it and are now living and breathing it. But for those organizations that have only adopted in pockets, it's, um, I'm not saying give up, but um, you'll find loads of challenges. Alim, I, I agree um, that it is sometimes difficult to have um, agile in place without that organizational shift. Um, but from, an, uh, from the perspective of running an effective PMO, Caroline, uh, whether it's agile or whether it's through any other, um, um, with other any other magic, it's, it's to make sure that you have a clear set of processes that the PMO is going to be working to. While you will always get pushback from people, um, as long as you've got those clear standards and clear um, uh, processes documented and um, circulated so that everyone knows how the PMO will operate, then you should hopefully be able to um, resolve and 
um, 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 deal with any of these uh, uh, neg negative views that you are getting because you've published them and, and they're there and everyone can see how you operate, whether it's in an agile way or not, that's a different matter. But if it is um, a, a query as to, oh, we're meant to be agile, well, everyone, uh, different people have different uh, opinions of what agile really is. Um, if you have documented what you think is your agile process and that's been accepted and it is being adopted by the PMO, then you're on, you're on good ground. Yeah, Caroline, do you, yeah, go on, Caroline, I was gonna say if you have a follow-up comment. Um, no, um, I mean, I know you did um, mention the safe one, which I know a few years ago, um, I did um, uh, come across that. With the safe one, would that be the plan, do, check, adjust? Is that the, the safe agile that you're talking about? No, 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 it's a bit different. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's so many courses in the safe one. They, they've got lots of ways of making money from that safe one. There's too much in it. There's, uh, I think, five, six different courses. But no, not, not, not planned to check that necessarily, no. So that, look, uh, by all means, look, again, this is exactly the reason why we're having this session, so that you can reach out to the mentors after. So whether that's me or, in this case, Dev, Martin or Ian. Uh, please reach out to them with some uh, more specific questions. But there's also a certification session starting um, at 3 p.m. today. I, I don't know if you've um, registered to attend that. So in that yes. certifications one, they'll be covering some of the certifications, which, you know, and, and including the agile ones, which you may be interested in. Um, the one that I've done is the Prince 2 Agile. Uh, and the reason I did that was primarily because I've been living and breathing Prince 2 for, for quite a while. And I've always adapted Prince 2 as has been mentioned. So I just thought that would be right for me. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a few out there. Um, but I stick to the point that it's so difficult unless the organization um, shifts its, in, its mentality you know, across the whole board or in that particular area you're working in to really kind of adopt Agile. Um, but yeah. Uh, other thoughts before we close up? Other questions anyone has? I just wanted to say thank you. Um, unfortunately, I only got this link late yesterday, so um, but I am um, joining the um, three o'clock one. Um, so hopefully, I'll um, pick up more from there as well. So thank you. Yep, no problem. And as I think I mentioned in chat, or maybe verbally, uh, all of the recordings from the sessions from Tuesday, Wednesday, and today, uh, and uh, the presentations will all be made available in the Slack channel. So if you're not um, a member of that Slack channel yet, uh, just email me. Uh, you've all got my email. I've sent you all an email. Email me, and I will send you the link. Okay. So let me then take the time to just thank uh, Ian in particular, but the other mentors and yourselves for joining. Uh, thank you all and see you on the next call. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.